The eyes have it. The eyes have it. The next item on the order paper is a motion on custodial sentences for attacks against emergency workers. And I'll ask the clerk to please read the motion. That this assembly supports tougher custodial sentences for those convicted of attacks against emergency workers in Northern Ireland, including police officers, prison officers, firefighters, search and rescue workers, and frontline healthcare staff, welcomes the campaign led by the courageous widow of PC Andrew Harper in favour of whole life sentences, which reflects widespread public frustration with the current outcome in such cases, acknowledges the recent UK Government commitment to increase penalties applicable under the Assaults on Emergency Workers Offences Act 2018, notes that in the Republic of Ireland there exists a set tariff of 40 years for the murder of a police officer, whilst in Northern Ireland the starting tariff in equivalent circumstances is between 15 and 16 years, and calls on the Minister of Justice to bring forward, as a matter of urgency, a revised sentencing framework which better reflects the seriousness of these crimes. Thank you. I call Mr Paul Given to move. Moved. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. I call the member, Mr Given, to please open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, one of the main responsibilities, and indeed I would uh, suggest the most important responsibilities of, ever gov of any government is to ensure law and order prevails in our society. And in having that responsibility, we empower and mandate uh, those that serve in our criminal justice agencies uh, to enforce the law that the parliamentarians on behalf of the people set. And so it's with that in mind that uh, this motion has been brought forward in my name and in my colleague's name, Mr Mervyn uh, Storey, who uh, leads for our members on the uh, placing board. And it came into sharp uh, focus uh, this uh, summer uh, when it came to the sentencing uh, of an individual for the murder of Detective Garda Adrian Donoghue. He was killed in County Louth in January of 2013, murdered in the line of duty, 41 years of age, married, two young children, and of course in referencing his uh, killing, we remember his family uh, today. But the sentence that was administered uh, as a result of that murder uh, to a uh, citizen of this country, Aaron Brady from New Road in Cross Maglen, he was found guilty of capital murder, and with that uh, conviction comes with it a mandatory minimum sentence in the Irish Republic of 40 years. Quite rightly, uh, the response to that uh, came from a number of quarters uh, drawing in to sharp focus what our sentencing framework is here in Northern Ireland when it comes to the murder of police officers. Our First Minister rightly responded uh, to that sentencing uh, decision, said that victims deserve justice in Northern Ireland, and we often have heard the anguished voice of those that have been left bereaved as a result of a loved one being taken from them. The First Minister rightly said uh, that there must be a strong deterrent when it comes to those that would consider uh, shooting, killing, uh, by whatever means, those that serve in our criminal justice agencies. The Police Federation, uh, in response, also said that there is an urgent need for the sentencing framework here in Northern Ireland to be addressed, to recognise the situation uh, that prevails in this jurisdiction. We also have the case uh, of PC Andrew Harper, again killed on duty, and those that were sentenced in respect of that killing, uh, one receiving 16 years, and two that were aged 18 got 13 years. And of course, the pleas there from the widow uh, of how the injustice that has been felt because uh, early release in those situations could be granted after two-thirds of those sentences have been uh, uh, delivered. And there the campaign is now taking place uh, called Andrew's Law, uh, seeking to have a minimum sentence that is put in place uh, for the killing of a police officer. And so whenever we look at those two examples, we of course in this part of the world can think of countless police officers in the past who lost their lives, that were killed in the line of duty. We can think of soldiers 
that were killed, and we can think of prison officers that were killed, and then we can think about the sentence that was administered to them. Of course, it's the reason why my party, one of them opposed the Belfast Agreement, one of the most immoral decisions and injustices inflicted upon the victims of those that were murdered was to have the perpetrators granted early release. That was one of the reasons why I wanted the Belfast Agreement to be defeated, because of the injustice that was carried out upon those that were victims and those that lost their lives as a result of that decision to grant early release to those perpetrators. And so when it comes to sentencing, there is an impact not just on the immediate family, but on the wider community. And there is also a, a distinction to be drawn upon those that serve our community as public servants. And police officers and prison officers and those that serve in the forces of law and order, they come with it a particular risk because of the individuals that they have to go out and face. I think most recently of the excellent operation that's been carried out against the new IRA, I think about those police officers that had to go through the doors and the premises and engage in all of that, who've had to gather the evidence. And obviously, as that uh, case goes through, I'm mindful of those family members who worry because of their loved ones that have been involved in that. And so they deserve to have the protection, I believe, of the law when it comes to how people are sentenced. And whenever we look then at our own uh, sentencing framework here in Northern Ireland, we have the lowest starting tariff for murder sentences of any region in the United Kingdom, starting at 12 years. And then when we look at the lowest starting point where a victim is in public service, uh, it's 15 or 16 years. And that represents half the penalty in England and Wales and is also lower than the 20-year tariff operated in Scotland. And of course, in the Irish Republic, the 40-year uh, mandatory minimum sentence. And that, that is why we then need to have... I will, briefly. Um, I thank the member for, for drawing this out. Can I also point out that it is not a mandatory minimum sentence served. It is a mandatory minimum tariff um, of 40 years, but there is actually automatic 25% remission of that sentence for good behaviour whilst in prison. So the end point is 30 years, which is more comparable with our end point, which is 25 years. Minister can elaborate later when she's got considerable time in dealing with this area. I want to get on to the Department for Justice and the Minister's role in this uh, in due course, but I just want to again highlight why those that serve in our criminal justice agencies require that additional protection. Attacks on prison officers in the prison establishments, 166 in the past three years. How many of them have been brought through the court system and what has been the penalty whenever it comes to the punishment uh, for them? Uh, and whenever then we consider where we are with the current sentencing framework, uh, former Minister Claire Sugden, I see here today, commissioned a review in 2016. Then we had a public consultation in October 2019, which was completed in February of this year. That would be six months ago that the consultation process was completed, some four years after the then Minister commissioned a review into the sentencing, which is regarded as the most significant review of sentencing uh, from 2005. And that covers a wide range of areas that need to be considered as part of uh, a review of the sentencing framework. Um, but we're not keeping up with the pace of changes elsewhere. We've had the Assaults on Emergency Workers Act, and that covers, and I know colleagues are going to mention, our hospital staff, our NHS workers, and other emergency workers, which I haven't touched on as my main contribution. But we know that in every year for the last number of years, over 400 ambulance staff have been subject to attacks. And we think about those reports of incidences that take place in our hospital settings, where our nurses are being subject to attacks. And so I know my colleague, uh, Mr. Frew, is going to, to uh, speak further around that. This motion deals with the wide gambit of sentencing that we need to, to have in place for our emergency uh, workers. And so whenever I, I look at the uh, process that we've followed, some six months later, we're still waiting on the Department of Justice to come forward with the new sentencing framework. And that's why I, I regret the amendment uh, that's been put forward in that it removes the call for tougher sentences. Why not? I, I appreciate it recognises the seriousness of these offences, 
But why is the Alliance Party not able to call for tougher sentences? Why did that need to be removed? And I'm sure they'll elaborate in respect of that. And the amendment highlights uh, this sentencing review process that's been taking place. Uh, and, and so I accept, in terms of the substance of what the amendment is saying, the issue I have is that six months later we're still waiting on it. Now, I'm sure uh, with the, this motion being the catalyst for the Department to look at this, we're going to see hopefully a positive announcement from the Minister for Justice later in her contribution as to when we're going to have the review carried out. But it needs to be carried out. It, it, I've only one minute left, so I'll not. But it needs to be brought forward as a matter of urgency uh, so that this issue can be dealt with. Then there's the debate of minimum sentencing and allowing then judicial discretion. And I have no difficulty with judicial discretion, but it's always within the parameters of the legislative framework that we have to set down. And so we need to send a very powerful signal that we back our emergency workers, we have their back whenever they're being attacked, and that we have an appropriate legislative uh, framework in place that reflects the gravity of the offences committed to them so that the sentence that is administered uh, gives them the support uh, that I believe that they should have. So I would hope that today we will send the right signal and support those emergency workers and that we will see movement coming from the Department of Justice and this minister uh, that it will be brought forward as a matter of urgency, the outworkings of that sentencing review, and then we'll consider the substance of what's actually being proposed. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr John Blair to move the amendment. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank you and I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party to move the amendment and hope also I will be able Mr. to clarify Blair. the reasons Mr. why. Blair. As challenged previously in this group, Mr. We Blair, order. I'm sorry. You just have to beg to move, and then I can tell you how much time you've got to do that job. Beg to move. Give me one wee second. Uh, thank you. Uh, you'll have ten minutes to propose and five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And apologies for that. Um, I rise, as I said, on behalf of Alliance to move the amendment and hope also to clarify the reasons why we in this group cannot support the motion. Um, like others in this house, I fully understand the sadness, anger and frustration when a police officer is killed whilst carrying out their duties. And I cannot make clear enough that I sympathise sincerely with the widow, family, friends and colleagues of the late PC Andrew Harper. In Northern Ireland, Principal Deputy Speaker, we of course need no lessons on the risks presenting on a daily basis to our police service, not least of all in the context of the ongoing and severe dissident terrorist threat. We have also seen all too regularly in public order incidents, attacks on fire crews and ambulance service personnel. But we should, at this juncture, also acknowledge that when recognising risk to what we have come to call our emergency or frontline services, that there is also risk to others in public facing roles. Just a few such roles which come readily to mind are retail sector workers in the context of robbery and other offences, taxi drivers, similar, bus drivers, the same, and civil servants, Principal Deputy Speaker in investigatory roles who have faced threat of or actual physical attacks in the course of their duties also. The amendment, whilst trying to overcome the limitations of the prescriptive list in the motion, nevertheless addresses, I believe, the concerns raised on behalf of the listed sectors, whilst trying also to address those concerns in the context of a sentencing review which is already underway. I would, Principal Deputy Speaker, also suggest to the House that the amendment, in addition to overcoming these limitations, also deals with practical challenges presented by the original motion, two of which I will go into in some detail. Firstly, Principal Deputy Speaker, there is, as I have referred to already, an existing sentencing review process. The consultation on which closed in February of this year, and on which it is reasonable to expect there should be a response in the near future. Good practice, I would suggest, should not facilitate predicting or undermining the outcome of that review consultation, to which interested parties, possibly including victims and their representative groups, will have responded and taken their time to do so. Politicians, those represented in this House, Principal Deputy Speaker, will know themselves if they have responded to that and if they have raised points that they may also be raising or have previously raised and are repeating here today. Secondly, on the detail, there is the challenge of perception of disparity in sentences when, in fact, in the neighbouring jurisdictions on these islands, 
all provide a mandatory life sentence for murder. There is the additional fact, of course, of difference in recommendations around time spent in prison, and no one is seeking to deny that, though these are determined, <coughs> excuse me, Principal Deputy Speaker, by guidance given to the judiciary whose independence we value highly. <coughs> it is also fair to say that there is currently specific Northern Ireland provision. The most recently created offence, assault and ambulance workers, emerged from work on this Northern Ireland Assembly following an attempt, as I understand it, to introduce an offence to recognise all emergency workers. With the collapse of the Assembly in 2017, the subsequent private members' bill to introduce an offence against hospital workers fell. I don't think the current minister or her immediate predecessors can be held responsible, whether it's on the, the lapse of that uh, preceding consultation or on the, the, that, that preceding legislation or on the current consultation for the lapse in time that was created solely by the absence of a Northern Ireland Assembly. So while we make specific provision for offences on assault and police fire and rescue personnel and ambulance workers, we should be aiming also to encompass a wider range of emergency workers such as nurses, midwives, prison officers, social workers and mental health care professionals. These outstanding matters, Principal Deputy Speaker, can surely also be dealt with within the current consultation. The amendment calls on the Minister, and it makes it clear, to bring forward a revised sentencing framework based both on the recent consultation as well as sentences available for equivalent event offences in other jurisdictions on these islands. It seeks, therefore, to address any perception of disparity. In closing, Principal Deputy Speaker, I will caution against any move or request to move towards any process which would replace the perception of disparity around sentencing with perception or reality of a hierarchy of victims set out in law. For example, this disparity would differentiate, I would imagine, between the sentencing and killing of a police officer or another services officer in a public incident and the, sentence, a public incident and the sentencing of the killing of a bystanding civilian, possibly on the same day, in the same street and in the same overall set of circumstances. This creates, without doubt, a hierarchy of victims. So, I, I am almost finished too, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I really don't see the moment. I have about 30, 30 seconds to go. Um, such a move, as described, Principal Deputy Speaker, is a disservice to fairness and victims alike. There should be no difference in the sentence for murder. I move and I urge support of the House for the amendment. Thank you. Before I call the next speaker, I want to remind the House I have uh, plenty of names on my list, and further down the list is a Queen's Council and a former Justice Minister. And I think they will have a valuable contribution to make to this debate, so I think it's important that we... Now, Mr Storey, don't chunter from a sedentary position. You'll get in too. I think it's important that we try to keep the debate moving to let people make a contribution. I call Ms Linda Dillon. and I intend to make my contribution brief, so hopefully that will, will assist in, in letting other members in. I think that it's, it's unfortunate that Mr Given made some of the remarks that he said around why he voted against or why he was against the, the Belfast Agreement because it allowed people who had killed police officers and others out of prison early with no thought for the families who lost loved ones at the hands of police officers through collusion and directly. So I, I think that maybe, and I agree therefore with Mr Blair's comments around the hierarchy of victims. I'm, go, I'm going to leave that aside for now because that's not really what we're talking about today. So I rise to support the proposed amendment. And firstly, I would like to place on record, and it's, it's stating the obvious, but it can't be said enough, that we support all of our frontline workers and any attack on our frontline workers, particularly attacks that result in serious injury or death, are completely unacceptable. These staff, whether in our hospitals, in our prisons or on our streets, need to have maximum protection measures put in place. We need to be putting 
measures in place to prevent and reduce these attacks, to ensure that they don't happen in the first place, because that's really where you want to be. The punitive measures are okay, but the harm is already done. So we really want to be at a point where we're looking at what can we do to prevent these attacks from happening in the first place. And in that, I, I welcome some of the minister's actions so far in terms of the prisons and what they can do to reduce attacks on prison officers within the prisons. So the DOJ has recently carried out the public consultation, and I'm sure that many of you will have responded to that, and I'm, I'm quite certain that many of the, the remarks that have been made today will have been fed into that consultation. In our response, we asked that... Uh, apologies. In our response, we asked that a sentencing review... Sorry, Robert. That a sentencing council should be established to look at the sentencing tariffs. I believe the original motion removes the ability of a judge who will have all of the facts of the individual case at their disposal to look at both mitigating and aggravating factors when applying the sentence. And this deeply concerns me. There is no doubt that those who attack our emergency services and frontline workers should most definitely be brought to justice. As in all cases, we want to see the sentencing reflects the crime. So in that, again, I say we cannot have a hierarchy of victims. The person who is attacked or killed as a result of domestic violence, has no, their life has no less value than any other member of our society. And we need to acknowledge that. And we also need to look at all of the mitigating factors where people have mental health issues, addiction issues. And I'm not saying that they should get away with attacking our frontline services. But we have many incidences where, where people in our frontline services would not want to see the book thrown at those people because they work with those people day and daily. They understand the challenges that they face. We have people with all types of learning and social disabilities who have great difficulties in communicating with others. So we need to acknowledge all of that in terms of this. And I think that we, we are not doing that if we do what the original motion asks us to do. So I rise to support the amendment and thank the party for bringing it forward. Mrs Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, at the outset, on behalf of the SDLP, I want to take this opportunity to place on record our sincere gratitude to all those emergency workers who courageously put on a uniform, step forward for the good of society on a daily basis. It's not their uniform that sets them apart from other individuals, but it's their commitment and courage to play a part in our society. I acknowledge the sentiment brought here in the House by Mr Given and Mr Storey in the, in the motion, and through its contents I also acknowledge the horrendous death of PC Andrew Harper as being the catalyst for its timing. The voices of PC Harper's wife Lizzie and his mother Deborah have resonated with many. And serious questions surrounding the determination of murder versus manslaughter and consequential appropriate sentencing have legitimately been raised. I rise, however, to support the amendment brought here today by Mr Blair and Mr Dixon, which cuts right to the heart of this debate within a Northern Ireland context. As we know, there is a current review on sentencing underway here, and the consultation having closed in February of this year, on behalf of the SDLP, I wish too to add support to the words in the amendment which shows gratitude to all those victims who courageously engaged with this consultation. It's fair to say that since March of this year, nothing in this House or outside it has been business as usual. And I believe it is reasonable that we have to give some latitude to the speed with which matters has, this matter has moved within the Department to date as resources were hastily, temporarily and correctly directed towards the united fight against COVID-19. However, as business as usual begins to resume, albeit in a period of COVID coexistence, I would urge the Department to build back momentum into developing the sentencing review. Mindful that a flow of information into the review may have been hampered, I also welcome the wording in the amendment that calls on the Minister to look beyond the consultation and consider sentences for equivalent offences in other jurisdictions in these islands. 
I would further urge the Minister to consider options for sentencing on cases that sit within that fine margin of a determination from murder to manslaughter. The question raised before us in the House today is this. Do we task the Minister for Justice, who has already has limited time remaining in this mandate, to begin to explore the possibility of creating a piece of legislation that looks specifically at sentencing of emergency workers? Or do we, as a House, unite behind the broader sentencing review, which has already started? The rigours of the legislative process will fac facilitate the level of discussion, deliberation and debate that would be required when consider considering a proposal to break from the principle that all lives should have equal protection from, and from the law and be equally subject to the law. The public and victims are all too often left outraged that sentencing does not reflect the horror of the crime committed, and rightly so. I believe we as a House have a duty to remedy this wrong as quickly as, and effectively as possible. The SDLP therefore believes if the Minister is allowed to continue undeterred with the comprehensive sentencing review, we will have the opportunity to explore in detail all those issues raised in today's motion. Three years of absence, COVID-19 and Brexit have all stripped our departments of time and resource. It's critical, where possible, that we get behind a focused way of moving such an important issue through this House. The SDLP therefore acknowledges the motion, recognises the sentiment behind it, but supports the amendment as the solution to getting things done. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Doug Beattie. Thank you, Mr Speaker, um, and, I, and I thank the members uh, for bringing forward this important uh, motion uh, for discussion. I, I have to say I'm a little bit uh, uneasy about it. Um, not the spirit uh, of the motion. I fully understand the spirit of the, uh, of the motion and what it's trying to achieve, and I will be supporting it, as will the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, but, but I guess I'm uneasy by categorising uh, any sort of a victim. Yes, uh, we must protect our blue light services, the police, the fire service, the ambulance service, the army operating under Operation Helvetic, uh, which is a blue light uh, service, as well as our nurses, paramedics. Uh, and prison officers' attack on them is utterly reprehensible, and any sentence must match the crime to act as a deterrent. But what about school teachers? What about bus drivers? What about taxi drivers? What about the old? What about the disabled? What about our children? Are they less deserved of stiff, strong, deterrent sentences? 50% of mainstream teachers and 90% of special needs teachers are attacked each year. 45% of them are verbally abused each year. Everyone, not just emergency workers, expect are, and are entitled to go to work free from the threat of physical, mental or verbal violence. So for me, the issue is not about sentencing for attacks against emergency services. For me, it's the sentencing framework which is our genuine uh, concern. Death or injury through drink or drug driving needs to be treated with the severity that it does act as a deterrent. And I know there are some people out there and say deterrents don't work, and I do not agree. Attacks on children must be seen with an aggravating factor and the same with older people and the sentence must reflect this. Terrorism sentencing must be addressed. Former Royal Marine Kieran Maxwell, who was tried uh, and found guilty of terrorist offences in Northern Ireland uh, but was done in Great Britain, got 18 years in jail. Had he been tried here in Northern Ireland, he's likely to have got 10 years and would have been out after five. That, for me, uh, is unacceptable. And this licensing, 50% licensing that we do for custodial sentences, I think is, is partly the cause of this, or this 50% parole um, for extended custodial sentences. The Ulster Unionist Party did feed into uh, the sentencing uh, review. Uh, and we noted the five purposes of sentencing, which are listed as 
punishment, protection of the public, deterrence, rehabilitation and reparations. We do not see prisons as a warehouse for offenders, but we do believe that rehabilitation seems to have trumped everything else. And at times, sentencing must be about the protection of the public and it must be about a deterrence. The principles of sentencing, proportionality, transparency, fairness, and the use of punishment sparingly injects a bias against harsh custodial sentences, and we have a concern in regards to that last principle. So what am I saying? I'm saying deterrence work. I'm saying deterrence against attacks against our police officers, our prison officers, uh, our emergency service, uh, workers and nurses. A deterrent does work. It must be seen to be working, and the people out there want to see it. They want to see our frontline services protected but they also want to see our teachers protected, our young people protected, our disabled and the old people protected uh, as well. So it's a sentencing framework that we really have to deal with. I also note that the First Minister's call for those who disappeared their victims to be refused parole unless they give the whereabouts of their victims. And I absolutely stand by that. I think that is something that we must address, and we must address it now, and I believe that should be respect, retrospective. So those people who disappeared, Columba McVeigh uh, and Robert Narak, if they're still about, should be returned to jail. Sentencing is always going to be a motive. We know that. We know what we're trying to achieve here. But I'm happy to support the motion, and I'm happy to support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Paul Frew. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, and I rise, of course, to support my colleagues uh, in this very worthy motion uh, uh, at this time. And uh, I suppose it is reprehensible uh, that our public service, public servants, and their families are not given the protection within law that they and their jobs merit. For our police service, our soldiers, um, and our prison officers. Their job is not a nine-to-five job. And even if it is, it doesn't end at nine and five. Their whole lives are wrapped around protection, around worry, around sincere measures that they have to put in place, even children, to protect them and their families from a terrorist threat, and has always been the case here in Northern Ireland. And I suppose if there's one thing I could appeal to the party opposite, the party opposite has a horrendous past in this regard, like no other party in this House. And I would say that whilst we can't change the past, you can't change your past, you can make a difference in the future by protecting these people going forward, them and their families. And to do the right thing by those people would be an enormous uh, and would be a recognition of the sacrifice of the past. But, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, if I could speak on the other aspect that, that, that is bound to be neglected here. We are, we're going to focus on the murders. There's no doubt about that, because obviously that, that those are the most horrific of crimes and, and the loss of family and the sacrifices made. But there is also an issue around assaults and the damaging of people. Uh, and that goes right across the spectrum of people who serve. That affects nurses and ambulance workers. And we have made a difference. We have made differentials between different people and their jobs. And has always been the case. So our job is to, to try, and, try and find that differential and try to be fair around that differential. And we have made exceptions for police officers, for firefighters. And uh, lately, a number of years ago in the Justice No. 2 Bill, when my amendment uh, for assaults on ambulance workers was successfully passed in this House. And that made a difference to those people and those workers who serve the community, who help vulnerable people, and who at times during their service fall under uh, circumstances where they are assaulted, some of them very grievously, 
uh, and damaged in the course of their actions. And Mr Blair, I think, alluded to the fact that I had a private member's bill in the front of this uh, House, this Assembly, uh, around the same protections around assaults for emergency workers. And I must say that uh, private member's bill was proving to be a challenge for a number of reasons, one of them being where do you extend this protection to? Because social workers are going into people's homes where they could be vulnerable and could be attacked also. And there's a wide range of healthcare workers, even people who work in uh, mental health hospitals who on a daily basis find very challenging uh, scenarios to deal with. Uh, uh, so that all had to play in the mix, and I believe should play in, in the mix. But one thing that is important when, when looking at all of this is the impact, the impact of a crime on an individual, how they suffer pain, uh, how that affects them, how that affects the role that they play, how it affects their job, their sickness, when they can return to their jobs. But not only that, the impact on other people. If you take somebody out of service, so if you assault uh, an ambulance worker or uh, an accident emergency nurse or doctor or worker, and they have to take time off work, even at that time, even at that night when they're assaulted, that could have ramifications which could mean the death, the death of someone else indirectly. And that is something that we should be mindful of when we look at these sentencing laws and when we, when we look at assaults. So even if, if a nurse or a doctor is assaulted and have to, have to leave their place of work for an hour, that could have massive ramifications for someone's life because that nurse and that doctor or that healthcare professional is not there to administer first aid to someone. And that could have massive ramifications right through the line and deprive people of their family members and their loved ones. And that is something that we should be mindful of when we pass these motions and the, this legislation. Thank you very much. I stand to support the amendment. There is a view that sentencing for attacks on people providing frontline public services does not reflect the gravity of the offence, nor act as a sufficient deterrent. It emerged earlier this year that there were 36 attacks on ambulance staff in the North in January 2019 alone. And in the 12 months leading up to 30 September 2016, 4,382 assaults on nurses were recorded in the health and social care sector. Additionally, in April of this year, a survey by the Shop Workers Trade Union suggested that incidents towards shop workers has doubled, with one in six of the almost 5,000 workers surveyed saying they had been abused on every shift. Almost two out of three of those questioned said they had suffered verbal abuse and around a third had been threatened by a customer. I am not downplaying the challenges our emergency workers face, but as Sinn Féin spokesperson on workers' rights, I found it horrific that any worker should face increasing abuse and violence. This should never be part of any job. And yes, whilst the punishment of the perpetrator needs to be a priority, so too does the support provided to the victims of these attacks. Therefore, in the process of the sentencing review, it is paramount that the contributions of victims to the consultation are fully taken into account moving forward. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And the motion that we are debating here today is indeed an incredibly emotive issue. Uh, there can be no doubt in anyone's mind that we must have a societal attitude where people who are on the front line of our emergency response teams can feel safe in the work that they do. Uh, that they are assured in the knowledge that they can go about their essential work without fear of injury. Uh, or their life being taken. Likewise, it is incumbent upon everyone in our society who is in their workplace, in their community, uh, home, school or streets feel safe. The violence witnessed throughout uh, the North for all too many years serve as a reminder to us that violence will only breed further violence. That assuredness of safety is underpinned by a societal response to someone who takes another's life with little or no motivation other than the job they are doing. Such a person must be assured that they will face the full consequences of the law of the land for their actions. A key component of that is a custodial sentence, 
which is consummate to the crime that is committed. All too often we hear of people that have been charged with murder who then receive a sentence that seems wholly inadequate and does not reflect the horror of the crime committed, the pain that is felt by the family left to grieve, or the moral outrage felt by a society that has witnessed this. And whilst I support the sentiment of the motion, I say to the proposers that I worry that if we pass it, that we will set a precedent. A precedent that says, if you murder certain people, you will get a particularly long jail sentence, yet if you murder others, you will get a shorter sentence. In truth, there is a danger here, albeit I accept unintentionally, of creating a hierarchy of sentencing and a hierarchy of victims. And I believe that that is a dangerous message. I believe we need to send a clear and unequivocal message that if you set out to commit a murder, you will receive a sentence that reflects that. Now, obviously, I do not want to detract from the judicial process that will take each individual circumstance into consideration, but I refuse to accept a situation where someone's life is valued as less or more based simply on the job that they do. I am happy to support the Alliance Amendment because it does all of what I have said. It recognises the contribution and heroic work of our emergency services and accepts that they should not feel that their life is valued less than others or face the peril of murder when they are carrying out their work, nor should their families live in such fear. However, I will say that the motion correctly references the sentencing review consultation which took place recently, and I think it is important that we allow that consultation to conclude uh, and then consider its recommendations before we prejudge and suggest changes to the current system. Many people believe that the system is too soft, and that is a view I am sure will be encompassed within the sentencing review consultation. I think it is best that we wait until we hear from that consultation, and I look forward to hearing its recommendations. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I support the amendment to the motion and hope that we can, it can receive the support of this House and that we will, at the conclusion of the consultation, send out a clear message that all murders will be considered equally and have the same rigours applied equally to. Thank you. Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I hadn't minded to speak in this debate, but I, but I couldn't not. Um, given that, um, and I have to declare an interest, I have 20 years' experience um, as both a prison officer in the Northern Ireland Prison Service for four years and 16 years as a firefighter. So <clears throat> if anybody wants to have a conversation with me with regard to what it feels like to work as, a, as an emergency worker and live under those threats, it is a job like no other. I've never been a nurse, but I do have nurses in my family who work. And, and the, many of these rules... They're not ordinary rules, guys. They are exceptional rules. And I pay credit to each and every one of those, whether they're in the police, the prison service, work in our hospitals, work in our health centres, um, in our prisons, and, and, and the, the, the fire stations and our paramedics, and there are many others. And some of them have been named by members today. Ab absolutely. Well. We're also, in, in terms of the... Uh, the jobs and, and the settings that he's setting out there acknowledge that we have a very committed and dedicated workforce in domiciliary care who are out there every day working in homes and who are also vulnerable to attack and dealing with complexity. Member Absol has an additional minute. Thank you for that. and I, I absolutely will. Um, I think for anybody that works in the community, you've got domiciliary care, you have mental health nurses who are working on their own in, in complex environments, and social workers, which is your own background, I believe. So we do have all of those workers um, who do step into areas where there is increased risk. It's not the same as working in a shop, actually. The risk is already there. It, it, it is slightly increased. And in fact, we have these peculiar circumstances in Northern Ireland, for instance, where uh, if you're in the police, you're in the prison service or any security job, guess what? You're not on social media as your normal self. We're still not there yet, guys. It's still an increased pressure in Northern Ireland. So there is a conversation uh, to, to be had. Um, I do welcome the spirit of the motion. Uh, I also welcome the amendment. And as, as my, my colleague has said, we will, we will vote for both. There were just a couple of things that perhaps uh, didn't sit right with me with regard to the total conversation that we're having today. Um, the member from Lagan Valley, we agree on about 90% of things, uh, issues like abortion and so on. The one we don't agree on is the Good Friday Agreement. In 1998, I was uh, 26 years of age, and I was a prison officer, and I voted for the Good Friday Agreement because I wanted something better. Everything that went on before that was absolutely wrong, and it was fine, and there were some things which stuck in my throat. 
that I had to see, but I knew it was the best thing for peace, I would vote for it again. And um, I'll have a discussion with anybody on that again. But we're not in 1998, this is 2020. And this is a, is a complex debate. And I, I do recognize the victims campaigners uh, like the widow of PC uh, Harper. And the pain that that lady will go through for her life and the impact on her family needs to be recognized when we have appropriate sentencing for premeditated murder. But there are many, many different types of violence that can be inflicted on each of the people that we're talking about today, whether that is social media, whether that's that coercive piece, whether it's the piece where you actually just don't get treated the same and you're slightly outside of society here in Northern Ireland, and that's mostly down to our security forces and the unique way they have to live. It's unjust and it's intolerable. But I believe, whilst I do believe in a strong deterrent, I'm also a keen advocate for rehabilitation and justice. I can't look at one without looking at the other. And if you're involved as I am, especially in and around mental health and that field, we cannot neglect the high rates of mental health and, and addictions that we have in Northern Ireland. And the correlation between excessive drinking, drugs, mental health, and acts of violence. So, in essence, Mr. Speaker, I will, uh, I will support the motion and uh, the amendment, but this conversation needs to be an adult conversation. The deterrent and the rehabilitation piece need to go hand in hand. Thank you. Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I do have to say this. This House significantly lacks credibility in discussing these issues and in propositions about tougher sentences being required. Because four of the parties that make up the government in this House were advocates for opening the prison doors and letting out the murderers, whether they were child killers or police killers, the unanimous view of four of the parties in this government was they are different. Let them out. I listened to Mr Blair talking about we can't have a disparity, a hierarchy of victims. It's a bit late for the Alliance Party to think in those terms, because in 1998, that's exactly what they endorsed. Now, if you killed a policeman, you get out of jail. If you killed your neighbour in a domestic or your wife, you stayed in jail. So it really is stretching credulity to hear people in this House talking about not creating a hierarchy of, disp of disparity when they, through their political parties, have done exactly that. That is why I say this Assembly, peopled in the main by folk from those parties, lacks credibility on this issue. And of course, lacks it particularly from the benches of Sinn Féin, who to this very day not only campaign for release of IRA murderers, but to this very day refuse to call them murderers, refuse to condemn them as terrorist acts, still justify those acts. And then they come here today nitpicking about whether we're going to be creating a disparity when they are the living, walking illustration of hypocrisy and disparity on the issue of criminality. When they yet cannot say it was wrong to kill. Nay, they celebrate, they glorify the killers. So I do stress the point. This assembly starts from a very low base in terms of looking for pontificating 
about sentencing for all. I do recognise there is an issue about picking particular sectors for a particular uh, format of sentencing, but there's a far bigger issue, and it's the one I've been talking about. But I do want to say to the Justice Minister, I think there is an issue she does seriously need to look at. In non-homicide cases, this 50-50 practice of you get half probation and half time to serve, it rightly is regarded as the soft option, because that's what it is. For most criminals, putting them on probation is that which causes them to laugh as they walk away from the criminal justice system. So this idea of a 50-50 process in sentencing is one of the things that is bringing uh, the whole criminal justice system into serious disrepute. And if anything is to be addressed, that, I believe, is an issue that needs to be addressed in a very vigorous way. So, I do think it's unfortunate that we're having a debate on an issue where there is an attempt to Has set up straw men. To conclude his remarks, please. To set up straw men about disparity when the very creators of this disparity are the people sitting in front of me. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <coughs> I rise to um, speak against this motion uh, for a multitude of reasons, uh, which I'll try to outline today. Uh, but I want to begin by uh, being very clear that this kind of a policy and approach in the motion uh, is straight out of the right wing playbook. Um, the motion references the fact that Boris Johnson's Tory government is considering a similar move, but it's also the preferred. Um, approached by Hungary's Viktor Orban, who was elected to power by pandering to a right-wing base with promises that he would introduce mandatory minimum and whole life sentences. Bolsonaro uh, has long advocated for harsher punishments in Brazil's penal system, and last year spoke of plans to introduce whole life sentences, which are advocated in this motion. Donald Trump, um, I know he has some fans across the chamber, uh, when first seeking election, won support uh, from the right for advocating mandatory minimum sentences for people trying to cross the US-Mexican border. It is the preferred approach by those on the right who view the issue of criminality as an individual problem rather than a societal one, and who rely on retribution rather than seeking out the root causes of crime in society. This approach has been criticised and opposed the world over because it completely overhauls the principles of proportionality and rehabilitation. And the motion uh, in front of us today references the south of Ireland as having uh, desirable mandatory minimum sentences. I would refer my me uh, members here to the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, who as far back as 1986 opposed such sentences, saying and I quote, the ICCL has always been opposed to mandatory sentencing on the grounds that it does not leave sufficient discretion to take into account the individual circumstances of the offence and degrees of culpability. The concept of proportionality has been recognised by the European Court of Human Rights as constituting an essential part of human dignity and grossly disproportionate. Sentences can be found to breach Article 3 of the European Convention uh, on Human Rights. The detrimental impact of mandatory minimum sentences uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on first-time offenders is also well documented and can be clearly linked to instances of re-offending. Most relevant of all, there is little evidence at all that tougher sentences actually deter potential offenders from committing the specified serious offences. It is also worth acknowledging that this approach uh, would roll back on a series of reforms which sought to remove political interference in the courts and lessen the long-term detriment uh, faced by those uh, serving uh, mandatory minimum uh, sentences. Uh, this isn't a proposal uh, which seeks to end re-offending or change behaviour in order to protect those emergency workers it references, because evidence shows that uh, this, uh, doesn't, this approach proposed in the motion 
does not actually work. Uh, the motion is simply an attempt to pander to those who view offenders as simply incapable uh, of change. Mr. Speaker, uh, I also want to speak to the hypocrisy I see uh, with this, uh, the approach uh, often taken uh, in this motion. There's, there is already a massive disparity in treatment and the punishment meted out uh, by state forces and those who aren't uh, state forces. This is summed up well by uh, the tragic murder of Mark Duggan at the hands of British police in Tottenham in 2011. Unsurprisingly, uh, Mark's murder has been in many minds since the uh, murder of um, George Floyd by US uh, police forces, and many other innocent black people have been tragically killed. Not, not only was the media and wider public misled by the police who lied, uh, claimed that Mr Duggan had opened fire on them, but even after that was deemed false, the murder uh, of Mark Duggan, uh, the murder of Mark Duggan was judged to be uh, lawful. No mandatory minimum sentences, no consideration of a whole life sentence. Those who took aim and took the life of Mark Duggan were given uh, effectively a free pass. And obviously there are countless uh, other examples, including those which happen locally, uh, of police and other uh, state forces acting with impunity and without a uh, sentence of this kind. Uh, this motion, uh, if it were to become policy, would serve to enhance that disparity. And finally, I do, Mr Deputy Speaker, find it galling that those emergency workers referred uh, by this motion, including firefighters, search and rescue workers, frontline health care st uh, staff, have found themselves standing on picket lines, begging the executive to pay them fairly, uh, or in the case of search and rescue, uh, carry out some of the most essential and worthwhile roles uh, imaginable. Uh, aren't funded properly and have to rely on uh, volunteers, donors and the goodwill of many people. The way this executive has treated these workers has been appalling for over a decade. And this the member's motion, time is up. I'm this afraid. motion does not even acknowledge that. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Thank you. I call Claire Sugden, but would remind her uh, she has five minutes. If she gives way, I'm afraid I can't give her an additional minute. So, Claire Sugden. Thank you. I might just do that, given that it never happens very often. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to support the motion as amended. This is my first preference. If the House does not accept the amendment, however, I am content to support the original motion. Um, my support for the amendment, however, is on the basis that the Minister of Justice does review the consultation responses urgently, formulates new policy and bring forward legislation, if necessary, before the end of this mandate. If that's not not possible, then I'm not sure we can support the amendment. I don't think that victims of this type of crime um, can actually go another two years without getting the proper justice that I sought to uh, achieve when I announced the sentencing review in 2016. I will make a quick note about the delay in this review. Um, I don't accept that it was because we had no executive, and I don't accept it's because of COVID that nearly f after, more than four years later, we are still at the consultation stage of the sentencing review. As Minister, I instigated the Department to get on with the work. That process should have been allowed to happen. The Northern Ireland executive didn't sit, but government departments continued to work. So why has it taken nearly four years to get to the point that we're at now? And certainly, I, I'm not putting the fault at the blame of, of the Minister. She hasn't been in post very long. But I would certainly um, encourage her to try and progress this as soon as possible. I do, I do accept that this is a really significant piece of work. There will, be, have, there will have been many responses to this consultation. However, if it's not possible to have a wider piece to address what has been raised by the various stakeholders, then maybe we do need to look uh, towards succinct pieces of legislation which address elements of it. I sought to uh, review the sentencing in 2016 mostly because of a, a, a lack of public confidence in our justice system um, amongst the general public. Um, it was felt that uh, sentences weren't fit for purpose. They didn't reflect the crimes that were committed. And whilst I've heard many arguments that we as legislators should not be guided necessarily by the emotion of the public, and we should look at this from a judicial and a, a fair justice perspective, we're legislators. The, the sentencing framework in which the judiciary will act will do so within legislation. We create the law. They interpret it. And if we, as representatives of the general public, are being told by our constituents that it's not fit for purpose, then we have to listen to that. 
I fully recognise and support the independence of the judiciary. They are far beyond qualified and experienced to be able to, to give um, a, their opinion in, in how we do this. And indeed, they are a major stakeholder, and we should be listening to what they say. But also, so are the general public, so are victims. The sentencing uh, review that I announced was also in part led, and it would be remiss of me not to mention the case of Enda Dolan. His father, you know, even in these last four years, has continued to pursue a change in, in, in the sentences around dangerous drink driving, and I fully support that. So whilst I am happy to acknowledge and support what the, the proponents of this motion have said, I do think it has to form part of a wider sentencing uh, review. There's also the point of parity and the practical implications of that. Other jurisdictions within the United Kingdom and indeed the jurisdiction of the Republic of Ireland do operate differently in this area as do we and it causes difficulty between the regions. So if anything we need to look at that as, as a practical concern of why we need to address this and address it quickly. I've heard some people talk of a hierarchy of victims. I don't accept that. I look at this as a context in which crimes are committed and and maybe evidence will suggest this, and I would really like to see this if we were going to pursue this type of motion. Disproportionately, prison officers, police officers, frontline service workers are targeted because of the job they do. And I think that's an important acknowledgement. These people are not being targeted because they are sitting in their homes with their families. They're being targeted because of the job that we as the public um, expect them to do to keep us safe. And I think that that is an important distinction when we're looking at crimes like this. But again, maybe it's not about pursuing it through a new piece of legislation or changing the sentencing framework in itself. People have talked about everybody is equal. But we have circumstances where other contexts um, uh, different types of victims are considered. For example, in the new domestic abuse bill, we have an aggravating offence against children. If children are present, present, then the sentence may be longer. So there are opportunities to look at this in other different ways. But I do, I do support the sentiment, but I think we need to do it as part of a wider sentencing review, if anything, an end-to-end -end justice review, but maybe that's for the next mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, question time commences at 2 p.m., and we need to allow some time for members to change places and to sanitise the benches. As we don't have time for the Minister's full 15-minute contribution, I propose with your leave to suspend this sitting until 2 p.m. Sitting will resume at 2 p.m. with questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, and this debate will then resume following the urgent oral question to the Minister for Health, which will be taken after questions to the Minister for Justice. Sitting is by leave suspended. Okay, members, we now return to the debate on custodial sentences for attacks against emergency workers. I now call the Minister to respond to the debate, and she will have 15 minutes. Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Dep or Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I wanted to start my contribution to this debate by, first of all, putting on record my appreciation and our shared indebtedness to all of those frontline and emergency workers who daily put themselves in harm's way to serve the common good. We all know the terrible price that some of those valiant public servants pay as they selflessly discharge their duties. I'm sure that I'm speaking for all of us in the Chamber when I say that our thoughts and prayers go to all of those families who have suffered loss through criminal and unreckless behaviour in our community. As lawmakers, I recognise we have a duty to adequately protect those whose role it is to protect the weak and the vulnerable. I also appreciate recent trials in London and in Dublin have thrown into sharp relief the issue of the adequacy of our laws in addressing attacks upon emergency workers. However, behind the rhetoric and the bold headlines, it is important that we bring calm heads to consider just what the differences in law are between the different jurisdictions across these islands. In truth, they are not as great as has been reported. For example, all of our respective jurisdictions provide a mandatory life sentence for murder. Sentencing de decisions are incredibly complex. Rightly, they are in the main left to our independent judiciary to determine. They not only have the experience and expertise, but the benefit of having access to all of the pertinent information required when reaching a sentencing decision. 
It is easy in many ways for us to sit in this chamber and express opinions about the robustness or leniency of any particular sentence, and we have all done that at different times. However, I am very conscious that sentencing on individual cases is a matter for the judiciary and that we ought not to, as legislators, second-guess the factors that led to those sentences, but rather focus on the framework within which those decisions are taken. It is also unfortunate that sentencing is, because of its complexity, often poorly understood. Recent reports on life sentences have, for example, conflated the starting points provided for a judge commencing consideration of the appropriate tariff for murder with the actual tariff finally imposed, and more worryingly still have conflated the tariff imposed with the actual sentence handed down. Further, few recognise that any tariff set is merely the first point at which someone can apply for parole. For example, with this extended custodial sentencing, a full risk assessment is then undertaken of the prisoner before decisions are reached. Judges apply both the law and guidance handed down by the courts or a relevant sentencing body in arriving at those decisions. In Northern Ireland, there are very specific guideline cases for the murder of police officers and other members of the security services. Current sentencing guidance for murder of police or prison officers was highlighted in the consultation document, which my department issued as part of the major sentencing review last year. For those of you who didn't have an opportunity to engage in the exercise or read the document, the guideline cases relate to sentences of 25 to 30 years, and may be higher in certain circumstances. When compared to the actual custodial sentencing for similar offences in other jurisdictions, those are not dissimilar. The sentence for murder in all cases is a mandatory life sentence, regardless of the jurisdiction. I want to return to the consultations on sentencing shortly, shortly in my remarks, as I believe that that is the appropriate mechanism through which to assess the issues we are discussing today. However, I, like other members, share the revulsion over the recent loss suffered by the Harper family. And I want to join with colleagues in their expressions of sincere and deep sympathy for the family on their loss, the result of a terrible and wholly unnecessary act and a wanton disregard for life. I understand that an appeal has been lodged, as well as a reference to the Court of Appeal for undue leniency, and therefore members will appreciate that I cannot make specific comments on that case or the sentencing decision. Whilst the murder of public servants, such as policemen, in the course of their duties is now thankfully rare, that does not diminish the grief of the families or the impact on communities when those things happen. Thankfully, sorry, I also appreciate that too many public-facing public servants continue to be assaulted in the course of their work, a matter highlighted by Paul Frew, Robbie Butler and others in the debate. Our current sentencing provision and guidance, whether in the Magistrates' Court or the Crown Court, specifically addresses the aggravating effect of attacks on public servants, where the victim is engaged in providing a service to the public and sentences are expected to reflect this. Doug Beattie and indeed others raised, others who are also vulnerable, others who work in frontline services and others who may be vulnerable victims themselves. Again, vulnerability of the victim is an aggravating factor which judges can take into account as they set the sentence. I'm going to thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Earlier in the debate it was outlined that within the domestic abuse bill, the current domestic violence bill, that an aggravating factor is whenever a child is in, in the vicinity of an attack. Would the Minister agree with me that whilst it's okay to have what you've just outlined in terms of somebody's role being an aggravating factor, that's very different to what this body of this motion asks for? I think it is in, in one sense in that the aggravating factor is one of many factors that are taken into account in sentencing. I think the danger comes when there is a, a very um, blanket approach taken to the particular circumstances that removes judicial discretion, which I think is hugely important in terms of setting the correct sentence. The approach of our judiciary uh, to such mindless attacks I think is best reflected by the Recorder of Belfast warning earlier this year that those who engage in attacks on medics or other healthcare professionals in their line of duty can expect to be sent to prison. Recognising the, compl the complexity of sentencing in this jurisdiction, I was very grateful to my predecessor, Claire Sugden, for commissioning a major sentencing review, which I inherited with this ministerial post. And I want to thank her for her contribution today. However, I do take issue with her view that the department has been in any way tardy over recent years in terms of advancing that review. The review was much more wide-ranging than a simple public consultation. 
A number of factors, including COVID-19, recovery of the justice system, and indeed development of policy ahead of the miscellaneous provisions bill next year, has impacted in terms of the small team that we have to develop these measures. However, I am convinced, and I know that my staff are convinced, that this is an important piece of work and that we will expedite it as soon as possible. As part of the review, an important consultation document issued last autumn, and the responses to that document will be published in the coming weeks. I know some members and political parties contributed to that process, and the conclusions and recommendations of this sentencing review will be helpful to me in considering what, if any, changes should be made to our current sentencing arrangements. As Minister, I was, however, disappointed to note when preparing for today that the party which brought this motion and whose members have spoken passionately in favour of reviewing sentencing, did not, in fact, make representations to the Department on the wide range of matters included in that sentencing review consultation, including a specific chapter on the consultation document reviewing the current sentencing here and elsewhere for assaults on emergency workers. Regardless, in responding to today's motion, I appreciate members' genuine desire to protect our public servants and deter attacks upon them. I share those concerns and will be looking carefully both at the outcome of the sentencing review and evidence from other jurisdictions on their approach to addressing this issue of public concern. As members will appreciate, we already have legislative provisions specifically for offences against the police, fire and rescue personnel and ambulance workers. I also notice that the motion wishes to extend the range of public servants covered by protective legislation. I intend to give full and careful consideration to the findings of the sentencing review, which also considered the range of public service occupations which may require specific legislative provision. In considering tougher sentences, I will give con careful consideration to what has been said during this debate and in the evidence on effectiveness um, of sentencing. And I want to thank Jim Allister for his contribution in this debate with respect to the issue of 50% remission and on whether or not that is appropriate or whether, as in the cases of extended custodial sentences, a review of public risk at the halfway point in the sentence may be a better approach. I have been concerned about suggestions over the past few days and today in this chamber, however, regarding fixing minimum sentences for some offences. We should approach with caution any move away from respecting judicial discretion by imposing fixed minimum tariff or sentences. Where we decide to do so, we must also consider the introduction of some judicial discretion to depart in the interest of justice from any such legislative provision made. These are complex issues and not ones which are amenable to off-the-cuff answers in the heat of debate. I have always had reservations regarding mandatory minimum sentences. I consider it important that we respect the faith and trust placed in our independent judiciary to determine sentences on the basis of the evidence provided in court. I am equally aware, however, of the public demand, which some paraphrase as demanding tougher sentences, but which in truth actually means longer custodial sentences. I, like other members, recognise the need to be responsive to people's concerns, but we must also ask ourselves what is the purpose of sentencing and how we balance the need to deliver rehabilitation, which is a fundamental part of that purpose, with ensuring that the punitive and public protection elements are adequately addressed. I'm also clear that there will be exceptional cases from time to time where the near equivalent of a whole life sentence may be absolutely appropriate, and our current structures do allow for that eventuality. However, thankfully, such cases remain rare. We must, however, guard against a populist approach, however superficially attractive, to sentencing that would lead to the situation prevalent in places such as the United States and Russia, where draconian sentencing has done little in practice to improve public safety. And I would acknowledge the comments that Jerry Carroll made in that regard. As elected representatives and legislators, we are therefore to be thoughtful and considered as we work to provide a balanced framework that results in sentences that are compliant with law, including international obligations, and proportionate to the crime committed and the culpability of the offender. Yes, that engender public confidence, but also, and I would argue more importantly, that are effective in terms of delivering public safety. Our programme for government includes, as an important goal, the creation of a safer community for all. Within the criminal justice system, this has focused attention on measures which will reduce reoffending and will promote the rehabilitation of offenders. It is right that we discuss these issues and consider together the role sentencing plays in making our community a better and safer place. 
However, it is worth noting that a 2018 survey found that fewer than one in ten people said having more people in prison was the most effective way to deal with crime. Early intervention, promotion of better parenting, discipline in schools and better rehabilitation were all rated as more effective responses. The sentencing review currently underway is the most substantial review of sentencing in Northern Ireland in the last 15 years. I want to reflect not only on the views expressed in today's debate, but also on the views of those who took the time and effort to respond to the consultation phase. I wish to have time to reflect on the responses from the public. In particular, I need to consider the impact on other victims if we were to create a differential between victims based on their perceived value or contribution to society. It is right that we acknowledge that some public servants, however, due to their occupation, place themselves at risk of harm in serving the wider community and require specific protection under law, as Paul Given has already stated. I will. The Minister for giving way, and I welcome the distinction that she's making in terms of some specific public servants. Can I just ask the Minister, maybe she is coming to this, other members have indicated support for your party's amendment on the basis of, of that being the vehicle in which these issues can be teased out and the quickest way to do that. Can the Minister give me some assurance that that will be brought forward um, to the Justice Committee and what will be the legislative vehicle where there will be legislation changed and that would allow us I think, to get on board and to try and get consensus as a way that we know we will be able to address these issues in the future? Well, as the member knows possibly better than most other people in the chamber, we have a very heavy legislative programme over uh, the next while. The deadline essentially for new things to be added to the miscellaneous provisions bill has, has now passed. And so it would be very difficult, given that I won't see this report and we won't be in a position to make recommendations for us to legislate in this mandate. But we can certainly prepare legislation in this mandate that would be of and ready then for someone who wished to take it forward at the beginning of the next mandate. And there are changes short of legislation in in terms of sentencing that could also be considered throughout the rest of this mandate. The important part of this is that we allow the committee um, and the Assembly to have full scrutiny over what we are intending to do. And Once I have received the report um, in relation to the consultation, I will be bringing recommendations to the committee in order that we can have that informed discussion. This is a sensitive issue, and I think we all recognise it. In my time as Minister, I have met with families who suffered the loss of a loved one through the violent act of another. Those families speak of the contribution made by their family member to their lives and the lives of those who knew them, not solely in terms of their employment. They may have been a teacher, a solicitor, a student, a carer, a volunteer. They may have worked in the public or private sector, been a homemaker, retired or unemployed. Such meetings are difficult for all concerned, but they drive home to me the fact there is no hierarchy of loss. To the families, their loss is a terrible thing to bear and no less so because of the occupation of their loved one. I'm clear that to provide good law, we have to approach sentencing holistically rather than a, a piecemeal or a cherry-picking approach. And we need to look at a, co a coherent sentencing framework in order that we can do that. I believe the sentencing review um, has done that so far, and I think there is merit in maintaining that holistic approach as we come forward and introducing a coherent sentencing bill as soon as the Assembly legislative commitments permit. I want to bring proposals for legislative change to the Assembly's Justice Committee for its consideration as part of the ministerial and Assembly decision-making process. <laughs> Turning finally, therefore, to the amendment, I welcome this as a measured and balanced approach. It reflects Just advise my own the views. Minister to draw remarks to a close. Please. It reflects my own views and rightly recognises both the balance between protecting our emergency workers and the need to have a holistic approach when it comes to sentencing. And I thank members for their support in this matter. Thank you, Minister. Now I call Mr Stuart Dixon to wind on the amendment. And, uh, Mr Dixon, you have up to five minutes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to everyone who has participated in this debate today. Can I start, first of all, by thanking frontline workers who protect and provide vital services to our community. As we all know, they face considerable risks on a daily basis, and we as legislators must work to make their jobs as safe as possible. I would also like to express my deep sympathy to PC Andrew Harper's widow and family. His death was an appalling act, and I think the lack of remorse for those was particularly upsetting. And I do understand uh, the cause for a serious look at sentencing. Frontline staff across our society face threatening behaviour on a daily basis, and that is clearly unacceptable. 
So a thank you to those who have supported our amendment. I believe it offers a sensible way forward while recognizing the crimes that have been committed. Um, we are completely at one when it comes to the victims of attacks on frontline workers and indeed attacks on anyone. Um, I want to welcome those uh, who have contributed to this debate. There is a problem, however, Principal Deputy Speaker, with lists because you risk leaving somebody off that list. I want to acknowledge um, those uh, that uh, propose uh, the original motion and encourage them to support this amendment today. A, a number of people across a wide range of jobs have um, uh, put their lives at risk in the public sector, and I don't believe it is possible to enumerate all of them in a piece of legislation. Uh, it's important that we recognise what emergency workers do on a daily basis. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the comments of Jim Allister in respect of this debate today, um, uh, and indeed all, many members who have spoken around the chamber, particularly what the minister has added to our discussion in uh, her preceding comments, uh, and welcome her clear setting out of the guidelines and the consultation that is currently underway. I would also welcome Mr Givens' acknowledgement as proposer of this, of this motion of our amendment and hope that with the Minister's assurances that he can now support the amendment uh, in front of the Assembly today. It must be very difficult and would be extremely difficult to tell one grieving family that their loved one's death was considered to be lesser than another according to law. We must allow our judges and our judiciary uh, to set the appropriate tariff in every circumstances. We do, as the Minister has acknowledged, have mandatory life sentences for murder in Northern Ireland. And it is clearly for uh, the judiciary, following uh, victim impact statements and others, uh, to set out what is the appropriate tariff in every single circumstance and, and, and uh, sentence. Uh, I would ask members to support the, mo the motion and the, support the amendment uh, to the motion today to call on the Justice Minister to bring forward a revised sentencing framework, which I believe is a balanced approach to this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you indeed, Stuart. And I would just say, great to see you back, and I wish you all the very, very best for the future. Okay. Um, I now call uh, Mervyn Story to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. And uh, Mr Story, you have up to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I think that we all do well to pause in this chamber today and to reflect on the many families uh, across a long period of time and many years who lost loved ones uh, to the hands of those who perpetrated evil against them. And our thoughts are with those families uh, today and to be assured and to assure them that every effort will be made by us to ensure that their memory is not uh, for forgotten or that it isn't somehow tarnished by our actions. Particularly, of course, we think of the family of Adrian Donoghue in recent, in recent times and also of Andrew Harper. But as has been mentioned already in this debate, we are never surprised by the actions and the words of the party opposite, because never do they come into this chamber, but that they take the opportunity to visit and revisit their view of those who have protected us through the years. And I make reference to the comments made by uh, Linda Dillon in relation to yet again seeking to sully the memory of the members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary and the Police Service of Northern Ireland. And I think that it is but a reflection of that party's view of law and order. And of course we have seen many examples over the last few weeks of their partial approach to even being able to stay within the confines of the COVID regulations. It's good enough for others, but it's not good enough for us. And so, yet again, not surprisingly, 
the party opposite displays duplicity, hypocrisy, and double standards. I have to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in coming to the debate, I welcome the fact of having to follow after the Minister. And I think that there is some glimmer of hope that the Minister is prepared to bring forward uh, the uh, information to the committee that would see a possible change in the framework, in the sentencing framework. And we welcome that that is a fact. While the amendment is not what we would have put, and obviously our motion is what we would prefer to be able to go, get through this House today, we do welcome the fact that others have said in the spirit of and with consideration of, then we would be uh, happy that the Minister would bring forward that uh, to the committee. However, it is disappointing that the Minister hasn't been able to give a definitive, conclusive uh, time frame in relation to this. And I accept the fact that she has said in regards to the amount of legislative pressure that is on her department, and I accept that that's the case. But she, as a Minister, has the power to be able to prioritise. She was able, in a correspondence with me recently, to be able to tell me that it wasn't a priority for her, the additional uh, police officers, even though it's in the new decade, new approach. And the minister has said that that's not a priority for her. So clearly she has some degree of flexibility. I would ask her to revisit that one as well. However, this afternoon we've had a varying degree of comments that have been made. And normally when you come to this part in the debate, it is a rehearsal of all that everybody else has said. I'm not going to go down that laboriously uh, because everyone has had the opportunity to say what they had to say. But I will comment on a few that have said uh, some uh, comments in this House this afternoon. I do welcome the comments from the former Minister uh, for the Department of, of Justice, Claire Sugden. And I think that while it was batted out of court by the Minister, uh, I have to say the, the member was on the money. And the, here is where we sometimes run a risk as politicians that somehow we are seen to be ungrateful to the service of our public servants. That is not the case. However, it is not good enough that with all the seriousness of the issue that we are debating, that in 2020, having had a consultation launched in 2016, we haven't seen progress. Uh, yes, the Minister. I, I have to correct um, the, the, the member. The consultation was not launched, as he suggested. The actual review was launched in 2016. The consultation was only launched in 2018. It's a much more complex piece of work than simply putting it out to public consultation. Yeah, yeah, and again, and again, the minister's defensive of the system, and probably to a lesser or greater degree. When I was a when, when I was a minister, I would have been defensive of my civil servants in the two departments that I was in. But at least I was prepared to come to this chamber and actually to say, whenever it wasn't good enough, whatever it was that has been done. And of course, you would also think to listen to the minister that there wasn't a problem. But somehow, you know, there's a bit of politicking going on and there's a, a few noises being raised. There is a problem. And there is a problem in society today that it seems as though you can break the law, you can riot, you can protest, you can do all sorts of things. You can attack uh, frontline workers, police officers, members of the ambulance service. I came from a meeting today with the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. And we have seen the attacks, the disgraceful attacks on members of the ambulance service. You can go down all the list of public service. And somehow we have to get to the root cause. We have to understand why someone has decided to inflict their form of justice on public servants. Well, it's not good enough as a society. And we have a society today that seems to have more emphasis on human rights than human wrongs. That is an industry that needs to be radically changed. But then, of course, when we say that, we are being accused of being extremists. We're way out, far right. That's an awful place to be. 
Tell the victims who are those who have to suffer as a result of these actions. And I think they are more prepared to accept that when you stand before the court, you will get a sentence that is fit for purpose and reflects the crime that was committed. Let's look at another case where we had recently uh, of Christine Connor. Seven years. Seven years to bring that person to now, thankfully, she's in behind bars. And the minister has to take responsibility for ensuring that there is the, the processes are in place to quickly deal with and appropriately deal with those who would inflict awful pain and suffering in our community. And of course, the minister made reference to the fact about being populist. Dear me, that would be an awful thing. The Alliance Party has never been populist. Like, really, I do think that the seriousness of this, and, and there has been a debate, and I think I welcome many of the comments that have been made. However, the seriousness of this cannot be underestimated if we believe that victims need to be listened to. And of course, we know the attitude of the party opposite to victims. The IRA were victim makers for far too long in Northern Ireland. And of course, we saw how that the party opposite had to be trailed to address the issue of victims in the courts just a few weeks ago. We welcome that that was the, the case. Yes, I'll give away. I think you will acknowledge that your own First Minister was taken to court to deal with the victims' issue as well in terms of what happened in Loch Gall and the fact that she wouldn't allow that to come to the executive table? Well, I think that uh, the member is seeking to try, as is always is the case, and create a diversion. It wasn't us. Well, I'm glad to be able to stand in this House today and say that I have never been supportive of a private army that has been responsible for the murder of innocent victims in Northern Ireland and then try to justify it as though it was some campaign for human rights or some ills that have been heaped on society. And so let us in this House, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker. Just advise the member to draw his yeah. remarks to a close. I think that while it is not the perfect place that we would want to be in terms of the motion and the amendment, if the guarantees that are given in this House today are delivered on, then I think we can begin to try and address this issue. However, okay. I would urge the Minister Members, time's up. At some degree okay. of haste and priority Members. in this would be okay. very Thank much Okay, thank you, Mr Story. Thank, thank you. you. The question now is that the amendment standing in the names of John Blair and Stuart Dixon be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. We have that again, just. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Okay. The question is then that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. No. Okay. The motion as amended is now carried. And the question remains is that the motion, sorry, excuse me, the motion is now carried. Uh, just move. Okay. Members, just take their ease for a few minutes till we move to the next item of business. Sorry, I just. I, I,